Right, I'm delighted today to be joined by Tony Attard, who is the Chief Executive of the Panaz Group. And uh, welcome to the Downtown Den, Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for inviting me. Uh, it's, been, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, I've been privileged enough to speak to you on several occasions. You've been to a number of events in Lancashire. So I'm aware of the fascinating backstory that you've got in terms of how you come to established, which is one of the uh, most successful Lancashire-based brands as Panaz. Uh, but of course, lots of people who are going to be watching this video uh, have not been, uh, uh, have had that, that knowledge. So I just wanted to start really by allowing you to tell us uh, about your career, how Panaz came about, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the experiences that you've, uh, you've had in business thus far. Well, yeah, we've, we've experienced a lot. Um, you know, get to, uh, yeah, my age and, and not experience a few things in business. Um, I think the, um, I, I, I never forget really when I first started, um, I've, I've sort of enjoyed every single moment of it. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the start off um, with, with nothing but a telephone and, and, a, and a big idea, uh, an idea that we've never actually deviated uh, away from actually. Um, uh, I read once uh, that one of the most successful, one of the most important aspects of business is actually having that big idea and sticking to it um, and having an obsession with it. And, and we do have that obsession. Um, and uh, it's never deviated ever since I started, which was basically to make us the most successful uh, contract furnishing company uh, in the world. Um, so we're certainly the, the largest in the UK. Um, we would like to be the largest in Europe within the next 10 years. And then obviously, we keep we keep it going um, because we're a family business. I now have two children in the business as well, which is a very satisfying thing. When uh, when you when you started it with a telephone, you know, thirty five years ago, um, and it's been a fantastic journey. The um, I mean, I, a lot of people sort of ask me why I got involved in textiles, and I think the the reason I got involved in textiles is because is is sort of multifaceted because it, it's an incredibly international business it's it's a global business um and uh, it 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 touches you everywhere textiles is something you wear it's something you sit on it's something you walk on you know textiles is just an enormous business and it's got such a rich history going back you know hundreds of thousands of years to the cavemen um and then you know going through different changes through uh, the Egyptians and, uh, and you know, creating the, the wraps that they wrapped the mummies in. You know, it's like a golden thread going through the history of civilization. It's, it's quite remarkable. And, um, and Lancashire, of course, was um, and still is a very important part of that industry globally. You know, we have a very rich culture here from the textile industry. And we also have a very strong cluster uh, as well in terms of both the, the manufacturing side and the design side. Um, so, you know, naturally I sort of ended up in that Lancashire, I suppose, but um, I started off, I was, I was from Paul in Dorset originally. Uh, and I just wanted to combine business with design. So I guess I could have gone into advertising or I could have gone into maybe industrial design or architecture. Um, but um, I chose initially to go into fashion uh, and I was accepted at St. Martin's to, to read fashion design back in 1976 when I finished school. Um, but then I saw this, well, I didn't see it, my tutor at school, um, who was very good, told me about this new course at Manchester University, which was um, about design management. And he thought it would be really good for me to get involved in it. So I went to see the team up there and they were really basing their, their structure, the course on what was going on at MIT at the time. Because uh, I was at the Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, which is, uh, which was a fantastic um, organization, obviously part of the Victorian University of M uh, Manchester, but very much science and technology based. And that we, we were, at, I, went, I remember, well, I'll go back to the why I took the course, to go went on that course and not go to St. Martin's, but I, um, I was offered a scholarship with Courtaulds uh, to go on that particular course at Manchester. Um, and uh, I thought it was, it was too good an opportunity to miss. So, I decided to take that course and, and really never looked back from that because the course was so um, so technically orientated. I mean, we would we would be doing 
polymer science and maths and economics in the morning and then we'd be doing life classes in the afternoon drawing you know naked whatever it was um and designing uh, it was an amazing course and then of course i came out into industry uh and decided to start my own company having been through Cortals and tootle yeah. um and you know i've loved every minute of it yeah. uh, and tony what made you have the appetite you think to set your own business up because obviously you know, Cortals, Tootle, big brands uh, no doubt opportunities yeah. within those businesses certainly opportunities in other parts of the industry sector so what do you think was it, within your DNA to say right I'm going to go out alone and I'm going to have a go myself I think I think you just basically answered the question actually Frank it's it's in your DNA you, you, if, you if you've got that instinct for it if you really want that sort of thing you're you're going to go out and get it i i remember um part of my conversations i used to have with successful people was how did you do it you know what was what was what made you make that first move i mean that was something that always fascinated me you know people in those days like richard branson for example and of course you know we, we were going into through uh the era of thatcherism where it was about people going out taking risks and doing things um if you remember if you remember the 70s i'm sure you probably don't but the 70s was probably the worst decade in our in our history um in 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 the uk and um you know we had three day week we had trade union problems we couldn't get anything done it was it was just a nightmare you know it's rubbish in the streets um political discontent it was terrible um the only thing that came out that was good that came out of the 70s was the music you know that that was brilliant but the uh it was terrible and and of course you had this new uh era of optimism um when margaret thatcher sort of came in at, and, and so sort of said look you know reganomics thatcherism you know we need we need to change things we need to put the power back into the individual to make a difference and and i think it was all part of that really that uh in, in you know empowered me um to to do it mm. Uh, and was it because of your experience in your job roles that sort of drew you towards textiles and furnishings? Because as you've mentioned, your initial thoughts were to perhaps go into fashion. But yeah. What made you sort of uh, decide and land upon uh, furnishings as, as the way forward? Well, I've always been fascinated with the technology of, uh, of textiles as well as the, uh, and the innovation of textiles, um, as, as well as the aesthetics. Um, and so I, I remember the, the catalyst was probably the, the 1970s fire in Woolworths um, where 16 people were killed. I think, was it 77? I can't quite remember now, 77, 78. Um, 16 people were killed in that fire. And I, I watched it from um, Piccadilly Gardens because uh, I was you know, at university, it was just around the corner. And I just remember um, thinking that this was a complete needless loss of life you know if we could actually you know build in aesthetics and flame retardancy into textiles that stuck that didn't burn it would protect people and i think i probably took that with me quite some time until deciding that really we needed to do it and um and so therefore i made that the focus of, of Benaz's goal and objective yeah. i think that we've probably saved you know in terms of our the reason why we do things we've probably saved you know a lot of lives by making flame retardant fabrics that people want to buy and install into public buildings and cruise ships and everything else yeah. it, it is one of the driving uh, forces behind panaz isn't it that safety element of, of your business so important yeah. uh, to yeah. you and to the company yes it is um but you know we're not slow in innovation i mean if you take for example this covid crisis i mean 20 years ago um we um we embarked upon a journey to try to alleviate hospital acquired infection in hospitals. Um, and uh, we felt that we did a lot of research with the universities and, and established that 42% of hospital acquired infections were actually derived or infected by around the bed in, in, a, in a, a hospital. Uh, and so therefore we started to work on um, how we could make our fabrics antiviral and anti antibacterial. Um, and we came up with a brand new range of products called Shield Plus um, and um, started to market them primarily in the States. And it's, it's proven to be an incredibly successful part of our business. 
Um, and we've now, of course, we were uh, going back, going to your original question about the, the COVID crisis and uh, how we've coped. Um, we've, we've, we were asked to stay open uh, as part of the essential supply chain for the NHS to furnish the new Nightingale hospitals that were, that were basically being developed around the country uh, to use our antiviral, antibacterial fabrics. Brilliant. So, so that innovation is, is having a real impact in terms of the wider community as well, which I know is, uh, you know, be of particular pride to you yeah. because I know yeah. what drives you and what motivates you. But it, just in terms of, of the business, and clearly you've been able to take advantage of that aspect uh, of what's happening out there, but there must have been impacts on other parts uh, of your business activity during the past four or five months. Oh, it's been it's been absolutely horrendous. I did a Zoom meeting yesterday over three continents um, with with our you know with our staff uh, talking to them about what had happened because although we've been updating them regularly with newsletters and things and and trying to keep and trying to have you know a continuous dialogue with them, it's been fragmented because people have been discussing things in groups which we've encouraged. Um, and so I addressed everybody yesterday and I told them that March twenty third was probably the worst day of my entire life when I had to furlough 65% of my staff had to, and in fact I had to close the business I had to close the business tell everybody to go home and my first instinct was uh, firstly obviously the safety of our staff that was the most important thing but secondly was you know how do I how do I keep this business going um, you know 35 years of growth and uh, could have all gone up in smoke so um, we, um, you know, I brought my accounts team in first just to keep a, a handle on stuff that was going on because there was nobody else here. So social distancing wasn't an issue. Um, we, we, we obviously, we looked at our cash flow very carefully. Uh, we, we, we did new projections in terms of what we felt was going to happen with the business. Um, we, um, we, we then brought in some other people relating to uh, essential operations. But then, but then, of course, we were asked to stay open by a lot of our supply, some, our customers because they wanted to use our fabrics, our antiviral and antimicrobial fabrics in the new Nightingale hospitals. So then we had to bring back uh, some of our operational team and eventually we brought back about 35% of the staff, some working from home and some working in the office. Um, and that's really, um, we, we've gradually started to bring people back last month, um, but we're still way off uh, bringing the 65 back yet. Um, We've been keeping a very close eye on order intake, sampling, uh, which is important to us because obviously people ask for samples of fabrics. Um, and, and of course, um, the number of orders and the value. And we have seen a big uh, upswing in May, June on the order intake, um, not quite as far as in values, but certainly in the, in the number of orders. So it's looking positive. Uh, and as we start to hopefully, fingers and everything else cross, come out of uh, the COVID crisis. Yeah. One of the things that you and I have had long conversations about, Tony, was the other challenge that we thought would be domini dominating uh, the political landscape this year, and that's Brexit. Uh, mm. You've mentioned, you know, Panaz's uh, desire to become the most successful in your space, in your... Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, you've hit that number one spot in the UK. You're very much a global brand and you're looking to become number one in Europe. What has Brexit done negatively, if anything, um, to those plans uh, as you've been plotting uh, to continue your progress and, as I say, try and dominate the European markets moving forward as well? Yeah, well, I can put it this way. I don't think many of our European competitors are actually losing any sleep at the moment with Brexit. Um, I think that um, they see it as, as, as a massive detriment to British industry and British ambition. Um, you know, I mean, I've been exporting. Uh, okay, oh. I found this on the web. <laughs> <laughs> Siri, oh, that's horrendous. <laughs> um, yeah, bas basically, um, you know, we've been we've been exporting since um, nineteen, well, nineteen eighty nine, since more or less when we started. And um, you know, exporting is, is part of our DNA because if you if you export, you are naturally an innovator because you are competing on so many different levels in so many different countries uh, that you have to be good at what you do. 
Um, and so that's why I mean, I, I advocate, I'm an export champion. And I, anybody that thinks of exporting is a really, it's a really great thing to do for your business. Um, but it, it's a massive own goal. Uh, Brexit is just completely ludicrous. Um, you know, how can you just turn your back on your biggest market? Uh, it's just crazy. I mean, I hope that we'll get a trade deal. If we do get a trade deal, then that's fantastic. If we don't get a trade deal, then we've made arrangements where we can trade with our partners in Europe through European uh, subsidiary. But that's going to be detrimental to uh, UK uh, tax because inevitably it's going to be another subsidiary overseas, yeah. um, which, I didn't, which I didn't want to do. Whereas at the moment, it's just an open book, isn't it? Um, you know, we do a lot of business in the States. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, sure. It could be an opportunity for us to do a bit more in the business in the States if we get a free trade deal with America. Um, but I just wonder what cost it would be to the UK economy, actually, because there's no way they're going to do a deal that's going to be detrimental to them. Yeah. I, I've always described Boris Johnson, Tony, as a, a lucky politician. Yeah. Um, now, I, I'm sure he didn't feel lucky when he got to COVID-19. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, uh, yeah. I do wonder that because Brexit uh, was looming and because he's nailed his colours to this mast of, well, you know, no deal. We'll walk away from negotiations and we'll go off into the work, big wide world ourselves. Whether actually there is an element of luck to this crisis because people will now be seeing this as any reason moving forward um, for the downturn that in inevitably we'll experience. I mean, like you, I'm hoping that some sort of trade deal is agreed. Yeah. Uh, equally um, hoping that you know, our European partners and friends. Uh, we'll see uh, the sense as well of continuing to trade with us. Well, I think that uncertainty is what drives business mad. You know, we, we uh, as companies right across uh, the country, we want some sort of consistency of approach. We want to know where the parameters are, where the opportunities are going to be, where the risks are. And uh, as far as I can see, uh, we're still no clear on most if any of those things as we stand today yeah well one thing i can guarantee you is that exporting to belgium is a hell of a lot easier than exporting to brazil yes yeah yeah you know, there's, there's no comparison yeah. yeah and in a nutshell that that sums it up really doesn't it it's it, it I, listen i think there were lots of issues involved in in the brexit decision but in terms of business and exporting um it, it was most definitely uh, shooting ourselves in the foot. So let's see what, what develops over the next few months. And uh, as you've said previously, you know, we can just do what we need to do and, and react however we need to. And that's what businesses, good businesses do all the time. Well, that's I mean, that's right, isn't it? I mean, people talk about Darwin being about evolution, but actually it's not. It's about adaptability. And, you know, the quicker you adapt, the, the more you move on and, and you progress. Um, and I certainly see that as, as a major part, a part of business. It's a bit like it's a bit like COVID, isn't it? Um, you know, some people will will respond to it positively. Some people will respond to it negatively. I mean, when I was when I was doing my presentation to the different continents yesterday, I showed the the projection of of the, well, Panaz as we've grown over the last thirty years. And whenever you've seen a recession, we've suddenly gone up straight afterwards. So, you know, we, we've we sort of added another £10 million worth of sales every time we have a recession. So, you know, bring it on. Yeah. And it, it is interesting to look at how particular companies react to, to these downturns. And again, yeah. I was reflecting on this a few days ago with someone else and saying in 2008, when the world last fell off the edge of the cliff and the financial crisis hit, you know, it was those businesses that, Perhaps kept their eye on the go on the their goal. Yeah, and actually maintained some positivity. They came out of this much quicker than yeah. those who sort of buried their head in the sand to an extent, or yeah. simply thought, "Well, we'll just slash and burn all of these things that we don't necessarily see as being essential." And yeah. that inevitably means things like marketing. It may mean some bonus schemes for staff. They were the companies from my experience, Tony, that really did struggle to come out of the last downturn? Yeah, I think there's a number of different things, um, I, I think, really. It's interesting because we had a KPMG um, 
you know, webinar thing recently. Um, and, um, and one of the things that came out of that was the strength of people's balance sheets. One, one of the things that they've been advocating over the last few years, and, and I think a lot of accountancy groups have been doing this, is because money's been so cheap, people have been saying, well, look, take your money out and then refill it with debt. I mean, and that's certainly, as we know, how private equity works. Um, you know, take the, take the money out and then, and then fill the company up with debt. Well, unfortunately, when, when things get tough, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't work. Um, my analogy as a sailor is, is very simply that, um, you know, the, the bigger your boat and the, the, the more maintenance you, you give it, you, you keep it in good ship shape order, then you get into a storm and you're going to weather it, you know. Um, and uh, there are no, loads of sailing analogies in that respect. I mean, one of the things that uh, I mean, I've gone through storms in, in, in boats across the Atlantic, across the Bay of Biscay, been hit by big storms. Um, and one thing you know within a storm is that um, you, know where the wind, you know where the wind's coming from, you know where the wave direction is because they're so powerful, you know where it's all coming from. What happens after a storm is that the wind drops and you're sort of bobbing around and you can be hit by all sorts of different waves from all sorts of different directions. And that's gonna be the same with this COVID crisis. So, you know, the, the stronger your boat, the more you're going to weather those rogue waves. Um, and, and that's about balance sheet. So when you've got a strong balance sheet, you can utilize a crisis to your advantage because you can buy extra machinery at cheaper prices. You can buy additional stock. You can invest in marketing and you can invest in new collections and new product. And that's the sort of thing you need to do in order to power out of these things. But if you haven't got the money to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Tony, just in terms of COVID and, as I say, hopefully we're coming out of it now. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get into the health side of the government's uh, performance because, sure. you know, there's been an awful lot of conversation about that. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of how they've managed the economy and the economic impact, have you been impressed, unimpressed or somewhere in between? Ah, uh, mm. I think I've been relatively impressed, actually, because I think that the I've never come across furlough before ever. I've never, never experienced it, never seen it, never witnessed it. So that was a complete new one to me. I think the only thing I would say uh, with reference to their economic policy is really consistency. You know, they've, they've reacted to certain industries and not reacted to others. So, for example, you take us as a manufacturer, which has 50 percent of its business is in the hospitality industry. We've, we've really had no help at all. And we've seen a drop in sales of about, in the first two months, of about 32%. Yeah. So, but my overhead costs, nothing's affected it. So I've still got my rent rates, um, you know, energy costs, and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, with furloughing staff, we can reduce our overhead in, in terms of our staffing costs. But in terms of our establishment costs, We've not really seen anything and yet small shops have had been given 25 grand you know uh, and and rate and rate rebates and you know god knows what else it's just a bit inconsistent so i, I thought a little bit more thought and consistency would have been a good thing i also have to say that you know this week the prime minister has made the statement about a five billion pound injection of cash into infrastructure schemes yeah i'm hoping that is um, just a drop in the ocean in terms of the money that the government are going to eventually spend because yeah. you know this is we're 20 percent down in terms of our economy at the moment 20 percent plus actually yeah uh, and to get us back to anywhere near uh, the level of activity that we want to get back to and we want to get back to it as quickly as we can uh, then we're talking near enough trillions never mind billions they've got to think really ambitiously greatly <laughs> in my opinion mm -hmm. uh, the chancellor's making an announcement next week uh, anything within the manufacturing industry sector that you would be hoping that rishi sunak may announce next week tony uh yeah bring back entrepreneur relief um you know i think some of the messages that are given out to entrepreneurs is wrong uh i think i think the stopping the entrepreneur relief was wrong um, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think what, what, they, what it's got to be is a connect between uh, central government and the regions. And so therefore, you know, I hope that they're listening to Lancashire, for example, 
and Lancashire are telling them, listen, we need this sort of money in order to increase our infrastructure spend uh, and to not necessarily put it into roads, but in to put it into broadband. One of the things that has come, become very clear with infrastructure uh, during the lockdown is the um, uh, what you call digital poverty that some people have in rural communities, for example. Well, it's completely wrong. That needs to be, um, you know, needs, needs to be brought up to date and there needs to be a level playing field for everybody with, with fast broadband connections uh, and that type of infrastructure spend. So I hope that what he's going to say is let's, let's get some of these things done. Um, I also think, I also hope that there's going to be money spent on HS3, which is the uh, connectivity across the Pennines. That would be fantastic for us up here. So that's what I'm, I, I'd like to see happen. Yeah. Uh, and we've not long to wait now. I mean, I have been impressed with Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, I have to say. I think out of all the government ministers, he's had uh, uh, the best uh, time. Yeah. Things he, he got off perhaps to a bit of a sticky start, but he certainly uh, managed, I think, to get hold of his brief. And he's been impressive whenever I've seen him. Certainly, that's that's my uh, take on. on yeah, he's very uh, very calm, isn't he? Yeah, appears to be. Appears. Mm. To be. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. He was the person that Dominic Cummings thought he was appointing uh, when, uh, when Sajid Javid had to fall on his sword. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but we'll see. You know, politics is, is interesting at all times, and particularly mm. so at times like this. Listen, Tony, you mentioned uh, earlier about your one of your uh, motivations to get involved in enterprise, setting your own business up, uh, was the advent of Thatcherism, and you mentioned Reaganomics. Now, yeah. most people will associate both of those characters and personalities with uh, individualism. Um, there is no such thing as society, was, uh, was a famous phrase that uh, yeah. Margaret Thatcher once used. Uh, certainly, it's seen as right-wing politics. And, and therefore you will necessarily associate people who admire that approach with those who perhaps don't take much interest in the wider community. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a dichotomy there, isn't there, in terms of your admiration, I guess, for at least some of the politics of that time from Reagan and Thatcher mm -hmm. and the way in which you approach uh, your involvement in the community that you're involved in, because I know uh, that you've massively uh, immersed yourself in, in Lancashire's uh, community and you're involved in some fantastic things, inc including uh, marketing Lancashire. But how do you see business playing a positive role? What's the sort of thing that you like to see Panaz getting involved in? And what commitment do you think businesses should be making to the localities uh, that they belong to? Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, should I change my background now? Yes, that'd be a good idea. Okay, I'll change my background because this is quite appropriate, I think. Right, there we go. There you go. Yeah. So, um, let me just move. Uh, it's, a, it's a mirror, so I have to sort of like, oh yeah, move <laughs> over that way. I'm sort of moving in the opposite direction. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, no, it's very interesting. I, th I think, to answer your question, I think actually a lot's been... Um, written about that recently. Um, it's it's about different times and different places. So, for example, you know, I I believe that Thatcherism was the right thing to come at that time um, because you know we had a, a world in a very different place, um, and we we had to have something which was dramatically different to what had happened before in order to make any any major changes. Um, so, you know, from, from Jim Callaghan to Margaret Thatcher, uh, you can't really, you know, there's such a massive difference between the two. Um, and the same thing with reference to um, Reagan, Reagan as well. When he came along, interest rates were at 19% in, in the United States. So, you know, Jimmy Carter had, um, you know, he had a, a major problem with inflation uh, and with, um, with all sorts of different areas of the, the economy. And so... You know, they needed to be very different types of people. I think now, I think it's a, it's a different type of thing. I think that we still have to have entrepreneurs that are willing to take that risk. But there's, um, there's a softer side to that, which is about corporate values. It's about sustainability. It's about, um, you know, giving something back to the economy. And 
and also making sure that people know that, that you're doing that type of thing. Because I think that just brazen, uh, you, know, um, you know, loads of money type analogies, and I remember um, that, that character yeah. on TV, um, you know, you, you couldn't get away with that sort of thing anymore. It's just not part of our social, um, social uh, place, I think. Um, so as, as a consequence, you know, we're very conscious at Panaz, and I think that most companies are now, with their green credentials, with what we can what we can do to balance the economy to make sure it's it's greener than when we first started, and and as a consequence, we're producing lots of fabrics now which are uh, environmentally friendly by not using certain chemicals, for example. Uh, all the anti antimicrobials that we use, by the way, are all um, we we test for cytotoxicity to ensure that they're not harmful to the environment whatsoever as well. Uh, they're all water-based, um, and so we don't have any uh, contamination issues, um, and they're not poisons, and that's another, another reason why they're so successful. Um, and uh, I think that um, you know, as as you know, we're, we're very proud. And we're very proud to be in Lancashire. Uh, that's our place where we work. We we employ Lanc people from Lancashire, and as a consequence, we feel that we should give something back to Lancashire. And I think that um, there's a great pride in Lancashire as well, you know, the historical pride and, and also the, the civic pride of where we're going to go in the future. And as an individual, Tony, you've immersed yourself into various projects. As I say, uh, you, the marketing Lancashire activity that you've undertaken, I think the organisation now is recognised uh, as being a key player in terms of Lancashire's improved reputation. Yep. Some of the initiatives that have come out of that agency i think over the last few years have been tremendous uh, and of course uh, the 2025 reference in that uh, backdrop behind you uh, it, that is talking of course about the uh, culture bid that we're currently involved in for the yeah. county so tell us a little bit how about how you got involved in marketing lancashire and then about the bid and where we're up to how that's progressing Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's interesting because um, I, th I was invited to get involved with Marketing Lancashire primarily because they wanted to reconfigure it. Um, originally, it was what you would call a, uh, a DMO, a tourist board type thing. Um, and uh, it was very much, you know, uh, tasked with promoting the county in that respect and, and getting people to come here to spend their holidays and that type of stuff. Uh, and then it was sort of like re was repositioned um, by Martin Kelly to be a little bit more um, orientated towards inward investment um, and, and promoting the, ca the county through things like MIPIN CAN and, and MIPIN in, um, uh, in London. Um, and, um, and so that remit sort of meant that the person that he needed to chair it was slightly different to the previous uh, chairman. Uh, who was Paul Heathcote, who did a great job. As you know, he's very much immersed in the hospitality industry and things. Um, I'm a manufacturer. I, I'm in industry. Um, obviously, I also have a, a very strong um, leaning towards um, culture and um, because of our, my arts background and also because of what we try to do uh, on the textile side. We, we supply hospitality, you know, cruise ships and that sort of stuff. So we have a very strong connection there. Um, so I guess they saw me as a bit of a hybrid so I could bring something to the party um, and I hopefully have done. Um, with reference to uh, City of Culture, there's, there are very few things that come, come along that can make such a profound difference as City of Culture. Um, and, um, you know, I thought, you know, Lancashire we're searching for a bit of identity, I think, in some respects. I mean, we, whoever signed the documents in 1974 to give away Liverpool and Manchester, I mean, well, they, sh they, they, they should be, you know, in, in prison in, in uh, Lancaster Castle, as far as I'm concerned. Because what they did was they took away um, two icons from Manchester, that people, sorry, from Lanc Lancashire, that people identified with. Um, and... Um, I think ever since then, we've been sort of searching a little bit for our own identity. But what we've got is a community which is 80% rural. We have a very strong coastal presence, of course, with wonderful coastline. And we also have some very strong urban areas like Lancaster, Preston, Blackburn and, and Burnley and things, all of which have their own characters. And um, I was just thinking, how, what could we do that could sort of unify the county in some common cause? 
And so I sort of started to look at uh, City of Culture back in 2018. And uh, I, was, I was very fortunate to, to know the chair of City of, the City of Culture bid, uh, Phil Redmond, I think you know, you know Phil, very yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Brookside and all those fantastic things. And um, we, um, we started to have a chat and I started also to talk to, you know, Hull and, and, uh, and also to Coventry with regards to their journey. And we commissioned um, a gentleman to come along to, uh, to look at the Lancashire cultural offer. And, you know, we've got such a fantastic um, cultural heritage. We have so much, we have so many assets in that area. It's just a question of bringing them all together. Um, and originally we were thinking about whether we could get Blackpool to do a bid or we could get Preston to do a bid or we could get Blackburn with Darwin to do a bid. But when we actually started to look into it in more detail, really, um, none of them had the, 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 the conurbations necessary to do it. Um, and so we started to think about how can we reimagine Lancashire? How, how can it be repositioned in the 21st century, you know? And, um, and we had quite a few discussions. And then we came up with this um, thought process of, well, if they've taken away our cities, well, Let's create another one. Let's let's make Lancashire a new virtual city, um, and um, and actually, that would be created by connectivity. It would be created by common purpose. It, it, you don't don't need roads. You don't need geographical constraints now to have a city. You know, times have changed where you know cities were created because of historical context, or they were on a river, or whatever it was. We don't need that anymore because we've got we've got the internet the internet of everything, you know? Um, it's about connectivity now. It's not about, um, it's not about geography. So we started to put some ideas together and we've got some very talented people to, um, to, to look at it. And we've come up with this incredible concept of creating a new city of 1.5 million people with a common purpose um, and with, with great connectivity, you know? So, and it's linked to the infrastructure and everything else. It, it links so well with, a lot of the things we want to do at the LEP, and it also links a lot of things that government want to do. Mm. And it's a, a very exciting bid. And as you say, I think it's unified the county, which is very important. And it's mm. probably something that has held Lancashire back in recent times. Not enough unification, not enough coordination. And of course, you and I both being frustrated, Tony, to watch those great cities of Manchester and Liverpool. Yeah. Yeah. have elected mayors, create yeah. combined authorities, and of course, on the back of that, win additional resources. Mm. Uh, and, you know, my plea to the politicians in Lancashire, and I'm sure you've had similar conversations, is put aside your parochialism, put aside the uh, party politics. Yeah. It's about the good of Lancashire. Mm. And if it means getting yourselves in a room once a month as a combined authority, electing a figurehead, and drawing down far far greater resources from central government why wouldn't we do that i just don't see the sense as to why we haven't been able to progress that argument up to this point yeah well i mean the, the other the other thing about the city of culture bid is the fact we wanted to redress the imbalance of investment that's gone into the cities in comparison to rural communities mm -hmm. so you take for example manchester i mean the amount of money that central government have given them because they because they can go to andy burnham or wherever it is there's a central area of responsibility um they they can they, they can lavish all this all these resources look at the look at the new factory um, de a development, the, the arts and culture uh, development for Manchester. Where's that happening in Lancashire? You know, I, I said to Andy Burnham very, very seriously, I said, I said to him, you know, um, this was at a, at a, in, in, inside a conference, um, and I said to him, you know, where do you see Lancashire figuring in the, in the uh, growth of Manchester? He said, it's a suburb, isn't it, of Manchester? That's what he said. <laughs> yeah. It's a suburb of Manchester. Um, it's an unbelievable comment, but in reality, unless we unless we do something about it, it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no reason why that can't be changed because Lancashire, given its rich history, tradition, the fabulous industry sectors that we've yeah. got there, uh, and of course its connectivity, both in the traditional sense and hopefully, if that investment is made correctly, in the new digital world as well, can be 
uh, a real force for good in terms of the northern powerhouse. We could have always said this, Tony, should be the glue that holds the northwest together. It's, yeah. the, it's the place that should be seen as one of the key and central drivers to future economic prosperity for the whole of the region. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You, going back to your, your original question about uh, about business and how it sort of changed and, and how it sort of linked, should link to the local community. One of, one of the things that we've always found is that, um, you know, you take, for example, a, a small area and you take take us in Burnley. You know, when, when we win awards and things like this, you know, it encourages people to come and join us as a business. Um, you know, and if you think of it on a larger scale, you know, if we if we were to win something like uh, City of Culture, and we have the backing of business behind us, as well as the politicians, um, and as well as the community, if we have this common purpose, and we have this, this common bond that joins us all together in order to achieve something like this, because it's a big goal, big ambition, um, uh, you know, the, the, the benefits to everybody is significant, not just to the cultural sector, but also to industry as well, because it means that more people will move to, to Lancashire. It means that you'll have a more, a larger pool of staff to be able to draw from. It means that more businesses will come here. And of course it develops, it develops um, um, wealth and prosperity for everybody, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and hopefully we're on that, the, the right roads on that journey. Now we seem to be hearing more and more positivity coming from our leading politicians in terms yeah. of getting the combined authority established. And that, of course, would be great news uh, when it happens. Uh, just finally, Tony, I know, as I say, you've got yourself uh, very much involved in the culture bid. You also um, sit on the Local Enterprise Partnership Board. Uh, I do wonder where you find the time. Uh, I know. Uh, I was saying that to my wife last night. I think <laughs> this, this week's been particularly mad. And, um, you know, yeah. Uh, so moving forward, I, I just wanted to really seek your view as somebody who has gone through decades now of evolution and how businesses have changed. Yeah. Uh, on this idea that you know COVID will change the world forever, that everybody's going to be working from home, uh, that we're going to see less people going out to eat in our restaurants, less people staying in hotels. Just wanted to get your take on that, whether you thought actually um, some people are perhaps uh, over imagining uh, the changes that are going to take place over the next uh, months and years. I think I think that anybody that employs anybody realizes that everybody goes back to type. So, you know, you can you can you can you can educate people as much as you like, but actually they always go back to type. Um, and I think this is no exception, really inevitably there will be some change and I think that that will be for the better. Um, I think that some, you know, we will encourage people to do a little bit more communication on, online, which I think is a really good thing uh, because it saves time. Um, I think that you, you can't have everybody working from home because where do you get your culture from? Where do you get your, you know, the work culture? And one of the, one of the important things at Panaz is that we pride ourselves in having a particular culture of high performance, which permeates all the way through the business. Uh, everybody knows where we're going. You know, we, we, everybody knows their part in the jigsaw puzzle and their part in the, uh, the whole, how it all works and, and their role in, in making sure that we do achieve our, our, our ambitions. What happens if you don't, if you're not there? Yeah. You know, it, 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 that sort of communication that's a given in the office environment won't be there. And so as a consequence, there could be a disconnect. Right? And we, we have seen a big disconnect with some of the people that have worked from home even during this period mm. um and and i think also people will be thinking well if i'm not seen i'm not heard mm. and i'm therefore not considered for promotion and i'm not considered for all these other things you know i think there's a lot of that sort of stuff that will that people will start to think about and um as far as hospitality is concerned i mean we have more time on our hands now don't forget hospitality is the second oldest profession uh frank I won't tell you what the first oldest profession is, <laughs> but it's the second oldest profession. And um, it will bounce back because it always does. You know, it's part of, it's part of our DNA. It's part of what we do uh, as humans. Yeah. And we've got a great hospitality offer, of course, in Lancashire. Yeah. Uh, it's been sad, actually, hasn't it, to see uh, yeah. some established names and some relatively new names uh, get into difficulties over the last yeah. few months. Hopefully they'll bounce back. 
yeah. uh, if we come out of this thing. But nonetheless, you know, when we get into 2021, hopefully a little before, Lancashire's offer uh, in terms of tourism and the visitor economy, uh, I think, is second to none. Yeah, absolutely. We've got we've got some some great places to eat uh, and and to visit and to and to stay. So yeah, it's, it, it is amazing. What I, what I would say is that what we have to do in these sort of situations is we have to put our learning and experience to our advantage. Um, I mean, I'll give you I'll give you a very simple e example. You know, um, the cruise industry. Okay, the cruise industry has been blighted by outbreaks of norovirus for such a long time. You know, they can have they can have a ships impounded all over the world because of norovirus. And now, of course, we've seen it with coronavirus. So my wife's saying, do I want to get on a cruise ship? But it's, it's, about, it's about people generating confidence in their product, isn't it? Um, and one of the things that we've been doing by promoting our anti, uh, antiviral uh, fabrics and things is that yeah, we can make things safer. Um, and uh, you know maybe we can learn from this, and so that we can prevent these sort of things happening in the future. You know we can be a little bit more concerned about utilising technology to our advantage. And 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 the internet's the same thing, isn't it? The same. Yeah, Tony, it's been great speaking to you as ever. Uh, I'm sure that uh, those who rain from Lancashire, of course, will be listening carefully to the. Uh, comments that you've made about the culture bid and we we'll, we'll yeah. want the support and get involved in that as yeah, uh, as things progress and uh, uh, the way in which you've started to develop those ambassadorial roles and you've started to really i think consult and engage with business far more effectively than has previously been the case you know i, I just want to pay tribute to the work that you've done in that area as well mate because i think we can really start to see the positive signs, the evidence uh, of how far that is starting to take the county now. So it's been great speaking to you today and hopefully we'll be able to get together for uh, a coffee uh, or something a little stronger in the not too distant future, mate. That would be absolutely fantastic, Frank. I look forward to it enormously. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Thanks, Tony. Okay. All the best. Cheers. Yeah, cheers, Frank. Bye.